I just wanted to welcome everyone to our GA knowledge sessions. And these are a series of talks and seminars about gemology that are fueled by our decades of research. And, you know, at GIA, each and every day, we're so excited uh, and privileged to seek and study and learn from, from gemstones. So, um, and it's really, a, it's our mission to share our discoveries with the world. So I'm really excited to kick things off today. I'm joined by uh, I'm Kelly Giordano, a uh, member of the content team here at GIA, and I'm joined by Nick Sturman, uh, GIA's Senior Manager of Identification, and he'll be speaking today about something he is incredibly passionate about, the fascinating world of shells and pearls. And as I mentioned before, he's joining us from Bangkok, so a special thank you for doing this at almost midnight, <clears throat> your time, Nick. Welcome. Um, and just before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. So everyone attending this is automatically muted. If you have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end where Nick will have the opportunity to answer any of your questions. So uh, we'll also be sending a recording of the session to you later today. And with that message that you'll get, there will be a survey. So we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass you over to Nick. Okay. So Hopefully the lighting is okay. Um, we discussed it a bit before. Um, I've, I've got the lighting onto the side here, so um, it should be enough. Um, obviously, I'm very happy that uh, so many people seem to have joined and are, are listening from all over the world. Uh, I saw one participant logging in from the Cayman Islands. That must be one of the most exotic places I think is, uh, people are listening in from. Um, I have a friend I know who said that they would set the alarm clock for one o'clock in the morning to be with us. I, I will see whether they actually said uh, wh whether he actually worked and he, he's listening to me now. Um, of course, I have all my friends in Hong Kong and Bangkok um, and uh, in India, Middle East, uh, Europe, uh, UK, uh, of course, is in Europe and uh, in America. So um, it's, it's good to have you all here. Of course, we're, we're in the situation where we're, we're all trying to get through a hard time. And um, these sessions, which are held by GIA and other organizations uh, are here, obviously, to, to help out at this time. And, and we can learn something new from one another. So uh, let me get on with the presentation. And I hope you will enjoy the contents. So, uh, okay, all right. So fascinating world of, I've, I've actually changed it to shells and pearls because of course the, the shells are usually first and then the pearls come become, because they come from the shells. So, so uh, it's logical. Um, and just, I wanted to start off with saying what we will be discussing now. Um, because of course it's night time for some of you, it's uh, uh, afternoon for some of you and morning for others, so I'll say now. Um, I'll go to a brief introduction to shells, um, just review of the bivalves and their pearls, uh, a review of gastropods, also known as the uh, univalves, and their pearls, and then to end, I'll just discuss a couple of uh, odds and ends, just, just to round off the evening. So I think that uh, pretty much all of you are familiar with the different shells. And I say shells, but of course they are mollusks. Um, they are from the, the phylum mollusca. And uh, what you see in the image here is just a very small selection of the shells that uh, you can see around the world. So all of these ones in the image are uh, saltwater ones. Um, and you can see that uh, they have an amazing range of colors. Um, I'll discuss most of these in more detail later. The only one that I probably won't discuss at all is, uh, I, I hope you can all see the cursor moving around, but the one on the bottom right, which uh, is a uh, spider conch. Uh, and uh, th this one does produce pearls, like most mollusks. Um, so I'll just go on now and discuss the mollusks themselves a bit. So we can split mollusks up into, as I already said, the bivalves, gastropods or univalves. These gastropods are basically snails. Um, we have also the cephalopods and uh, chitons or chitons. So uh, you can pronounce, there are several pronunciations as we go through the presentation where you can actually 
give different uh, pronunciations depending on where you're from or who you are. Um, so I actually took this uh, table on the right hand side of the slide from the web and it just shows you that there, according to this particular website, around 55,400 different types of mollusks that exist in the world. But in actual fact, when you look uh, through different websites and you look at different research articles, this total number of mollusks that exist in the world varies considerably. I mean, I've seen figures of 120,000 um, down to about 40,000. So, so really, it's, um, it's something which is very difficult to give a specific figure on. Uh, and you will see that uh, we have the snails on the top of the list here. They say mussels bivalvia. But in actual fact, not all bivalves are mussels. Quite often, as far as gemologists are concerned anyway, we consider the freshwater um, bivalves as mussels. And most of the others are, are just considered as uh, oysters. Um, but we, I'll discuss this a little bit more detail later. Then we have the cephalopods, the squids, and the scaphopods, uh, the elephant tusk, etc., and the chitons. So there are actually many different uh, groups within the mollusk um, phylum. Just to give you an idea of the cephalopods, um, there's a one odd one out here, which is not a cephalopod, but all these others are. So we have the octopus, the squid, cuttlefish, the chambered nautilus, and the argonaut, or the paper nautilus. Um, on the left-hand bottom, we have a tusk shell, which is a scaphopod, so it's, it's the odd one out. But uh, in theory, all mollusks can produce pearls, but they don't necessarily uh, all produce pearls. It's, it's just possible, but there are only certain mollusks that actually do produce pearls, especially on a commercial basis. And this is just a, an image of a, a chiton, um, so you can see. It's, uh, they can be quite big. They can range up to one feet in length, um, or one foot in length, um, but usually are smaller than that. But again, very colorful. And you'll see later on that some of these mollusks, when they're in the ocean, like many um, marine life, uh, they are very colorful. So uh, I've already discussed about um, some of the types of mollusks, and I'm going to, in this presentation, discuss two main um, ones, and they are the bivalves and the gastropods or the univalves. Um, you can see that uh, on the bivalves, uh, pretty much everything is the same. So we have salt water here, uh, we have the fresh water, and we have composition that the shells uh, and the pearls have uh, calcium carbonate in the form of aragonite, and they can also have calcium carbonate in the form of calcite, so the two polymorphs. Uh, gastropods are also the same, uh, salt water and fresh water, and uh, aragonite and calcite, but uh, I actually was a little bit unsure about the calcite in the gastropods. Uh, most of the time when we do work in the lab, we find aragonite. So I, I was asking my team earlier um, just to sort of help me to check and they, they searched around and they found that actually calcite has been referenced uh, in freshwater too. Um, and it makes sense because uh, cal uh, you know, aragonite calcite are found in shells. So how do we actually in the lab know whether a shell, I'm going a little bit more into the scientific part now, but, but most of the presentation is not like this. So this is just a, a little bit. Um, how do we know that um, the pearls, which we know are classified as organic, but in more strictly, they are actually biogenic. Um, and even you can say they are biominerals because the way that they are composed, they actually have mineralization in them. So they are formed of aragonite and calcite. And we can actually, in the lab, uh, any lab, can separate uh, the, the polymorph of calcium carbonate. And we can see, using um, a Raman spectrometer, that we can find certain peaks which relate to aragonite. So you can see here the blue spectrum. And we have what we call a doublet here, 701 and 705 nanometer, uh, sorry, um, centimeters or wavelength. And we have here at uh, 712, just one single peak for calcite. So this subtle difference, we can separate them. And also 
In the um, CAL site, we have one peak at 280 wavelength, but a series of peaks uh, in aragonite. So we can tell in the lab pretty much um, easily whether, whether the uh, pearl is composed of aragonite or calcite. And we can actually zoom in and you can see the detail a little bit more. So in aragonite, we very uh, can clearly separate the, the doublet here, the two peaks in the spectrum. And here we have just the one peak in the calcite. So that's how we can tell whether um, a pearl or a shell, but obviously we're testing pearls in the lab, um, are composed of aragonite or calcite. So let me just speak about some of the bivalves. Um, I'm sure that many of you will recognize this one, but I'll speak about it a little bit later. Most of the pearls that we see that are salt water in the jewelry trade around the world um, are actually from this particular family. It's the Petraidae family. And I'm showing a selection of them here. So in the top row, uh, we have Pinktada maxima, which of course, from the name, uh, maxima means the biggest one for this particular family. We go through to Pinktada margaritifera, Pinktada mazatlanica, Pinktada fucata, Pinktada radiata, and then the smallest one is Pinktada maculata. And on the bottom row, we have the pteria. So we have pteria penguin and pteria sterna. And these produce uh, a lot, as I said, of the commercial pearls, natural and cultured, uh, that exist in the world's markets. When we look at the surface of these, we call them nacreous pearls. Um, I, I know I'm speaking to a lot of you who know this uh, probably more than I do about pearls in some cases. Um, but anyway, for those who are maybe not so familiar, um, we have the surfaces of these nacreous pearls and they have these uh, um, overlapping, what we call platelets, uh, nacreous uh, structure, and they can be like the one on the left, very fine. They can be a little bit coarser in the center. And then you can have some actually different patterns in pink powder species too, like the one on the right hand side. Pateria, um, their patterns tend to be slightly different. Um, not always, but from our general experience, they tend to be a little bit more, what I would say, frosty. Um, not so defined, and they have these very beautiful patterns sometimes. So there is a difference when you handle enough of them to sometimes see the, the, the difference in, in the nacreous structure between the pinctada and the pateria. And all of these things help with the identification. Of course, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about identification today. This is, this is a different topic. Um, so going on to the specific uh, mollusks, we have Pinctada radiata, uh, very familiar. Um, it's known as the Atlantic or the Gulf Pearl oyster as well. Um, and this one actually is a, an image I took in Bahrain when I worked there uh, many years ago. And uh, there are natural pearls, and these are two Pinctada radiata shells. And uh, one of them actually, the one on the right hand side with just a little pearl by itself, this pearl is a blister pearl. So it's actually attached to the shell. Whereas all of these pearls here are what we call whole pearls or cyst pearls. And they are uh, loose and form within the tissue. Um, so that's, that's just another uh, little snippet of information that some of you may not know about. But they, although we use the word oyster, you could see there before, they are not really strictly oysters in the true sense because they, they are mollusks and they are bivalves, but a true oyster, and I have a friend um, who many of you know, and she absolutely hates it when anyone uses the word oyster with the pearl forming ones which are commercially used. Um, so a true oyster is actually more from the oysteridae family. Um, and this one here, the edible oyster, which is the um, uh, Eastern or American oyster. And these aren't actually pearls in the image. These are um, shell, which were fashioned into cabochons. Um, and they, they sort of look very nice and can be used in jewelry too. Um, so this is my colleague in uh, Carlsbad, um, Kun Pai, or Atetea Honkraje. And she took this image for one of the lab notes, which is in uh, Gems and Gemology. So if you want to read more about it, then of course you can go and have a look. Um, Pinctada radiata uh, comes from the 
um, well, mainly it comes from the Arabian or Persian Gulf. Uh, as I said, I, I used to live and work in Bahrain for many years and uh, all of this area around Bahrain, all the way down to Dubai, uh, even to Oman, um, is the, the main source uh, of Pinktada radiata. Uh, of course, it uh, can extend uh, to other places too, but this is a famous source. And uh, Basra is a name that uh, a lot of people know, especially the Indian dealers and the uh, Middle Eastern dealers. Uh, it's not really the name of a type of pearl, it's just uh, a word which is associated with Pinktada radiata pearls that come out of the Middle East because it's a, a town in Iraq and it was a, like a trading route on the way from the Middle East to India by land. Um, so you'll often hear, uh, as I said, especially from the Indian dealers uh, and the Middle Eastern dealers about Basra pearls. Um, so it, it's not really a specific type of pearl, it's, it's just associated with the area from which they were found. And uh, again, an image I took when I was in, in, uh, in Bahrain, this is a typical type of pearls which were submitted at that time, and I know are well, still submitted these days as well um, by some, some of the dealers. And um, the red cloth is just there to, to offset the color of the pearls and make it easier to see them. And this is uh, very typical of the Middle Eastern uh, dealers. They like to use this and of course in India too. And you can see the, the number of pearls in relation to the size of the loop uh, and the range of colors from white to the creams to more yellow. Um, but uh, we, we used to see a lot of pearls, kilos of them, sometimes submitted in one go. Um, so, and they are still found today. Um, if you speak to any of the, the staff uh, who work in Bahrain um, still, uh, or anyone who knows about uh, what's happening in Bahrain at the moment, you, you will know that uh, there are plenty of divers who are still going out now to find natural pearls. There, there are around about 3,000 or so of, of them at the moment. Now, uh, Pinktada radiata is actually very closely related to some of the other um, similarly looking um, Pinktada species. And in actual fact, if you look at this book, The Pearl Oyster by Southgate and Lucas, they actually refer to this whole um, group of similar, um, genetically um, similar pearl, um, oysters uh, as uh, basically Pinktada fucata martensi radiata imbricate species complex. So, because they are so similar. Um, and in actual fact, when I went to Vietnam um, and talked to some of the pearl farmers uh, there who use uh, different uh, shells to produce the uh, Akoya type pearls, they actually uh, use another one, which is Pinktada chemnitzi. And so actually you could probably add Chemnitzi to this as well and add one more to the complex. Um, so these uh, mollusks can actually be found as, as well as the um, Persian Arabian Gulf in the Gulf of Manar, so between uh, India and Sri Lanka. Um, historically, this was a very famous source as well. Uh, also, um, you could go to Venezuela and off the northern um, coast uh, of Venezuela, you have obviously a, a, a series of islands stretching up and there's one just off the bottom here, it's called Isla de Margarita. And uh, this was also quite a famous source uh, and uh, Imbricate is, is one which is associated with this locality. And of course, Japan uh, for Fukata, uh, Martensi is very famous as well for, for this uh, sort of group of, of shells. And when we look at Pintada Fucata Martensi, you, this is what we associate with the Akoya um, shells that are pro um, produced, this, these Akoya pearls. Um, so they, they are obviously very well known in Japan and ar around the world. Uh, this is just to show you the sort of range of sizes from when they're very young. So the spats are when they're one month old, you can see at both ends on the top row. And as the age increases, of course, they get larger and larger. 
So the largest here would be about five years old. So it's, um, they're not very big shells, um, uh, but uh, around about two years or so is when they can start being used for um, producing pearls. And it depends on the farm. Some may do a little bit younger, some may do a bit older. Pinktada maxima. Um, this is obviously, as I said before, maxima, so it's the largest of the, of the family. And we have this one showing uh, a natural pearl positioned in the mantle. So this is the mantle, and it's actually, because the shell was opened, uh, it shrunk when it was open. So it would have covered the, the whole of the inside here. And this is a sort of a usual position for, for natural pearls. Um, this image was taken by uh, my former colleague and boss, uh, Ken Scarrett, uh, and it uh, was when we were on an Australian trip. Um, so this is a, a, an image I took when we went to Myanmar um, and uh, we were visited one of the farms. And you can see that in this particular series of three shells, the color is different in that there is a, a definite uh, more golden area on the, on the inside here. So really what I was showing you there is two types of the pink tartar maxima. We have the silver lip, which would produce pearls which are more white to cream, such as the ones on the left-hand side of, of the screen. And these pearls can be very beautiful. Um, obviously, these ones are bead cultured. Um, you can also get non-bead cultured and you can get, as I showed you in, in the, the image before, uh, natural pearls too. Um, so they do still find natural pearls in Australia, but there isn't as much diving that takes place as in the um, Middle East. Uh, and actually, this necklace is one of the, the best necklaces that uh, exists for South Sea or Pink Tada Maxima pearls. And uh, to show you the other one here on the right hand side, this is a gold lipped um, Pink Tada Maxima um, layout. So they're actually, these are loose pearls. They're not drilled, but they're ready for a necklace. And this is also probably the best uh, golden, uh, what will be a strand one day and one loose pearl for a ring. So the area through which the Pink Tada Maxima can be found, uh, it stretches by uh, quite a lot of uh, geographical area from Australia. So Broome to Darwin, um, all, all the, the Indonesian islands, the Philippines, uh, and then also to Thailand and also to Myanmar. So, so it sort of extends over quite a large uh, geographical area where it can be found. Um, Pink Tada margaritifera, many of you will know as well, produces the black pearls um, and uh, that's why it's often referred to as the black-lipped uh, oyster. Uh, I was just throwing this one in just to show something a little bit different. Uh, it's uh, a faceted pearl. Um, so, you know, obviously not all pearls uh, are left completely untouched. There is a specific market or a specific product, product that can be produced from pearls sometimes. And this is just one of them. So it's something which, you know, you either like or, or you don't. Uh, it, it's um, something a little bit unusual. Um, Pink Tada Margaritifera comes from Tahiti. Okay, I know this is not Tahiti on the side of Fiji, which is a bit further away, but still, Fiji also has um, very beautiful pearls which come from Pink Tada Margaritifera, uh, Margaritifera uh, typica. So it's a, a slightly different uh, subspecies and uh, it produces very beautiful pearls. So if you ever have a chance to see them, you should have a look. Uh, Pink Tada Mazatlanica. Uh, this is uh, um, one which is also referred to as the Panamanian pearl oyster. So that will obviously give you a good idea of uh, where we can find it. Um, and one of the most famous pearls that possibly, I don't guarantee it, but possibly came from Pinktada Mazatlanica is um, La Peregrina, which was sold at Christie's. So this is a Christie's image on the left. Uh, and we have a history of it uh, um, from a website that I found that shows um, uh, 
who owned it uh, through the different stages of its um, existence. So Philip II of Spain in 1527 to 1598, Mary I of England, then all the way through to Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, who I'm sure you all pretty much know are associated with it. And it was sold for many millions of dollars in auction um, a few years ago. So the reason I mention this is because when it was found, it was reportedly found in Panama. So it's, here is Panama down here, obviously famous for the Panama canals as well. And uh, it's possibly why, because Pink Tada Mazatlanica comes from this region and for something that large, it's quite a large pearl, it would probably have come more likely from that species. So it's, it's just uh, another bit of information which may be interesting. Uh, Pinctada maculata. So this, as I said, is the smallest of the Pinctada family. And um, it also has a, a name. They call it the PP pearl uh, or PP shell. And um, it can produce actually very nice uh, pearls, um, usually natural. Because the size of the shell is very small, it's not really something um, that is, is cultured. Although my colleagues in the Bangkok lab, uh, they did write an article, which is on the GIA website, um, about some attempts, some early attempts at producing um, shell cultured blisters on these. So they actually inserted a, uh, or placed a, uh, a hemisphere on the surface and, and tried to see whether it would be overgrown by nacre to produce a blister. Um, and it sort of partly worked, but uh, as far as we know, there are no commercial um, whole pearls produced by this. Um, they come from um, the, the Cook Islands, um, as you see here. Um, so this area, so not far from Fiji again. Uh, so now I move on to Pateria sterna, and here we have also, you can see the name, we may have a sort of a nickname for it, the rainbow lipped, because it actually has a very beautiful um, orient to it. Uh, um, you can see on this shell, on this sort of near the top, it has this very strong um, orient. And these two pearls here are Keshi pearls, which are produced um, by, were produced by this shell. Uh, this is one particular one which we tested uh, in Bangkok and it uh, came from an English dealer who I know pretty well. They used to use us when, when uh, we were in the, when I used to work in the London lab as well. And this is actually a blister pearl. So it was cut from the shell and it was a pretty big one. And in order to remove it from the shell, they had to destroy the other half. So it was only this other half which they managed to keep and uh, they submitted it to us. And again, this is something which is uh, uh, on the GIA website as an article. It's worth having a look at. Um, Pateria sterna in particular comes from um, Baja, California, which is obviously this area in Mexico. Uh, it's a, it produces a lot of pearls, not, not only Pateria. Um, later, I'll talk about some other ones uh, like spondylus species. And this is a, a very good source for some of the other species too. Uh, Pateria penguin, uh, also known as the winged pearl oyster, um, because it has uh, this sort of foot at the bottom. And actually, this one is slightly broken, so it extends out a little bit longer or further, usually. And this is the type of pearl which comes from Pateria penguin. It's uh, white, but it has sort of uh, slight patchy brownish areas on it. This is very typical of, of the appearance of this type of pearl. And it produces quite a lot of uh, natural pearls too. Uh, this was a, a group uh, of Pateria penguin that um, came from Phuket in Thailand. Uh, and uh, someone brought them to us in the lab and uh, sort of uh, said, okay, you know, you have these for your, for your reference collection. And uh, this is just showing where Phuket in Thailand is and shows you the area. But Pateria actually, Pateria penguin itself comes from quite a large area. So I, I've seen it in Myanmar. Of course, it's, that's not too, here in uh, Mergui, it's not too far from Phuket anyway. And you can see it all the way through the, the Philippines and the Indonesian islands. Um, so it, it can extend uh, to quite a few places. 
So I'm still sticking with the um, nacreous pearls and uh, still looking at the bivalves. And I move on now to the freshwater. So you can see here the freshwater shells or mollusks have uh, very beautiful coloration sometimes. You get some very strong purples, pinks, and again, obviously, quite a lot of them are white. And this is dependent on the species. They all have um, some very, they all have a specific uh, Latin binomial name, um, but they also have sort of quite interesting nicknames too. Uh, things like the pig toe. I'm sure that many of you who know about the freshwater American shells in particular will have heard of these names. So pig toe, three ridge, washboard, uh, purple pimple back, uh, and uh, pink heel splitter. And in actual fact, there's also one which has the name of a golf stick pearly mussel as well. So there we are. For any golf fans, you, have, you, ha you can remember that one. Um, okay. And this is actually showing uh, a field trip that some of the US team took to Tennessee. And you can see the amazing colors of some of these shells. So the two largest ones here are the pink heel splitters. Um, its Latin name there is Potamilus alatus. But this is quite often what you will find for the majority of the freshwater pearls uh, and the shells. And um, they produce some very typical shaped um, Baroque pearls too. We have the, the feather or wing pearls which come from the certain area of the shell here up near the hinge. Um, but we can get some very beautiful um, whole pearls as well, which are round or button or drop, etc. too. But these shells are not only important for producing the pearls, I think that most of you who know about the pearl industry will also uh, appreciate that they are very important for producing the shell beads that are used for the cultured pearl industry globally. So certain um, species of the freshwater, especially from America, um, need to be white because, of course, the whiter the shell, uh, the less um, banding or imperfections in it, the better for the cultured pearl um, manufacturing uh, the, the nuclei. And this is a, a wing um, pearl, the typical natural type pearl that you get uh, from, from the USA. Just showing you a map of uh, the Mississippi and the whole network of uh, fresh water uh, estuaries, uh, tributaries, etc., from the from the Mississippi. Whereas we know that also freshwater um, pearls are produced from China. Um, there are other places than China, of course, too, but uh, China is the main producer of the freshwater non-bead cultured pearls that are found in the global markets. And all of these provinces here are famous uh, for producing um, these types of pearls. And when we look at the, the colors of a strand of pearls, such as this one here, um, you can see that some of the colors are absolutely incredible and, and freshwater pearls can have some absolutely wonderful colors. So this is actually a mixture of freshwater and saltwater pearls. So anything which is sort of this strong purplish or the pinkish colors, um, even the sort of oranges, the, the sort of apricots, these are usually what you would associate with freshwater um, shells. Uh, whereas in the other ones here, the golden type pearls uh, and the sort of the, the greenish ones and the, the sort of anything which is more grayish or like this one up here at the top, these would be more associated with salt water. So in something like this, even by sight, you can have a good idea just from the coloration whether something is fresh water or salt water. But in a lab, we would have to do more work to actually prove it. And, and um, so we would, even if we have a good idea just by looking, we have to go ahead and, and prove this. Um, so before we issue it on a report. And this is a sort of quantity of pearls that you would find. 
in China. This is actually uh, at uh, one of the famous producers uh, in their factory and they were sorting out the, the pearls and you can see the absolute, all of these um, sacks here contain pearls too. So there is a, a, a very large quantity uh, and a, a full range of different colors uh, as well. Okay, so those were the ones which, uh, what I've been discussing so far are producing pearls commercially uh, and what you usually see in the market. And then I'm moving now on to some of the other bivalves that um, you still see in the market, but not to such a degree. So we have here the Pinedi family, and uh, they're also known as pen shells. Of course, pen pearls come from the pen shells. Um, and these are interesting because, well, we have two particular um, species from this family here. We have this one here on the left, which is the darker. It's uh, Atrina. Um, the Atrina species. And then we have this one here on the right, which is the lighter color one, and it's uh, uh, just the uh, Pinna, um, Pinnadi. So you can see that here we have one area where we have a different structure. In actual fact, when you look at this, it's actually nacreous. And then the majority of the bottom of it down here is non nacreous. Um, and so the structures are completely different on both of these parts. And these two pearls down here, the yellow drop and the brown button, these are completely non-nacreous. So, so there's no nacre on them at all. But because of this double sort of structure, this pearl here on the left actually shows both non-nacreous and nacreous structure together. And quite often these type of pearls, when we x-ray them, they are showing sort of a hollowish structure. And when we look uh, with a loop, at the non nacreous area, uh, a loop or 10 times magnification, that sort of uh, level on a microscope, this is the sort of structure that you would see on the shell and, of course, on the pearl um, of one of these uh, pen pearls. If we increase the magnification, you can make it look very nice. It sort of has this cellular type structure, almost like a plant cellular um, appearance. Um, and it has a certain degree of uh, translucency to it as well. And this just shows you the fact that shells and pearls do have um, uh, that sort of crystalline structure to them. Of course, this is very obvious. This is a one piece of shell and it's broken. So you can actually see that uh, when you look at the bottom uh, surface here, it has that sort of cellular structure, which is the top of these uh, acicular needles of calcite. So this is, if we actually tested this with uh, uh, Raman spect uh, spectroscope I told you about earlier, we would get a, a calcite um, spectrum from it and we would prove that it's calcite. So there are only certain shells which will show us calcite. The majority of them tend to show us aragonite. Okay, uh, moving on to tridacnanini. <laughs> it's always a bit difficult to pronounce these properly, subfamily. Um, it's much easier just to say tridacna. Uh, so we have here the tridacna gigas, many of you will know. It's the giant clam. Um, and then we have tridacna squamosa. So there, there are uh, quite a few species with, within this subfamily. And we have here hippopopus hippopopus, which is also within this subfamily. So I've actually put two uh, inserts here, which are from the worms taxon, and they show you the actual um, criteria or the classification for, for these both. So you can see the slight differences. So for Tridacna, we have Cardidae here, and then we have Tridacnae here, and Tridacna here. And for the Hippopopus, we have the same and then the same, but it changes to Hippopopus here. But they come under the same subfamily. Um, and these pearls tend to show very nice, the Hippopopus, from my experience with talking to dealers who know about them or going out to the field and speaking to people who actually dive and find them, they tend to show very nice flames compared to the Tridacna, um, although the Tridacna do show very nice too. Um, they, they tend to have 
uh, you'll see a bit later in the next few slides, some very distinct flames. Whereas Tridacna gigas, from my personal experience and the team's experience in GIA labs globally, um, they do have flames, but they tend not to show such wonderful flames as Hippopoppus and maybe some of the other Tridacna species. Uh, this is what a tridacna will look like when it's in the ocean, um, in its natural habitat. And the actual mantle is very colorful and it comes out of the shell completely. Um, and so you can still see the shape of the shell. And when we went to a, a farm in the Philippines that produces the cultured pearls, we were actually very pleased to see that they had one part of the farm um, protected and um, uh, and they actually had these tridacna shells in one in this particular part and we're, we're actually letting them um, form there and grow without any interference so this is actually a, a pretty big shell and this guy is actually pretty strong the, these can actually get to be very large indeed and this one i don't think is gigas i'm not absolutely sure it could be but when they're fully grown, there would be no way that this man could lift one. You would need a forklift truck, they're that heavy. So, so they, they can grow very large. And this is what we would see when we have a, a look at a, a tridacna pearl. Um, it has this beautiful flame type structure, um, which is obviously completely different to what we see on the nacreous pearls. And I will show you a few other uh, pearls which have similar structures as we go along. Of course, I, I know that I'm probably spending too much time. My goodness. Well, all right, I'm going to speed up. I didn't know I'd, I'd get carried away sometimes. Um, OK, so this is the flame structure here. When we magnify it, you can see that uh, they are very beautiful structures. You can, you can see that it has very nice flames down here on the bottom right one. Sometimes they look a little bit frosty, like this one down here on the bottom left. Uh, Mercenaria Mercenaria is an interesting one. Um, this is also sometimes uh, referred to as a clam, but of course it has nothing to do with Tridacna. Um, it, uh, as you can see from the, the taxon details at the bottom here, um, it's not related to uh, Tridacna in any way, as you saw from, from before. But uh, Mercenaria Mercenaria is a uh, quahog, also known as quahog, and we have a northern quahog, um, which is that one. And we also have Mercenaria campanchiniensis, which is the southern quahog. Um, and they can produce these very nice purple to whitish pearls. Oh, sorry. Um, this is from my colleague Chun Wei in uh, Chun Wei Zhu in uh, uh, New York lab. And he found this the other week and put it on the GNG Facebook uh, page. And it actually shows somebody who opened one. Um, uh, Quahog and found this purple pearl just where you can see his finger pointing to it here on the edge. And this was found in uh, Three Mile Harbor. Now, if you look at the Google Earth and you'll see New York is over here on the left. And then basically it's not that far from New York. It's this area here. So this was found just when they were opening the shell and, and, uh, and, and checking. Uh, also, many people will know clam chowder, and this is one of the ingredients of clam chowder. And quite often you will hear stories about people uh, eating their, their um, clam chowder and they will bite onto something hard and they will find the pearl. So uh, this is something that you will see many sort of newspaper reports if you search online about. This is a very nice mercenaria, mercenaria that was found um, by a friend of mine, it's Elise Skullwald. And this was a very nice one because it actually was sitting in this indentation in the shell. So it wasn't attached to the shell. It was a loose pearl, but it just basically when it was opened, it was sitting in this um, dip here and it was, it was a, a very nice piece. When you look at the surface of the shell, you'll see that it does have a sort of flame structure, but it's very weak. It's not so clear. And this was again taken by Ken um, of a shell and when we when it, when he took a picture of a pearl you can see that really the flame structure is not showing most of the time they don't really show um, any any clear flame structure 
Um, I, this is just to show the color, it's going back to the Raman again. So we can see before I told you about the, the composition, whether something is aragonite or calcite. This one is um, uh, aragonite because we have this peak here and we have the doublet I mentioned before. But these other very strong peaks are all, all relating to the color. So when we see something like this, and this is the full range of the Raman, we know that it's naturally colored. Um, so it's, it's a very useful test as well for, for checking whether something is treated colored or natural colored. Uh, Pectinade is another one which is um, producing pearl sometimes. And uh, this again shows you when it's in the water, it's, uh, it's a very nice coloration, the mantle there. And you can see it here when it's out, you probably all recognize it. It's the scallop shell or, and we produce the scallop pearls. So one thing to notice here, is that the inside has this nice sort of purplish. In this particular species, it has this purplish color and it has white. And this is reflected in the pearls which are found. Um, but the outside is a completely different color. And you know, I'm sure from seeing these uh, on, on, in shops or uh, um, on the beach that they can come in many different colors. But the pearls themselves tend to stay pretty much what the color you see on the inside of the shell. So you have these sort of, uh, whitish to lighter colors or darker brown to purples and um, these brownish colors and when you look under the microscope you see this very typical classic structure which helps us to identify these scallop pearls um, and they are also um, when we when we check under the the raman we will find that these are these are calcite so it's another helpful sign not that we need to see because the structure is pretty typical and we can also get other colors from the purple. You can get reddish examples. You can also get white ones as well. Um, we have another one here, spondylus. Uh, so it's spondylidae family, which is also aptly named spiny or fawny oyster. And it produces these very beautiful, but unevenly colored usually, um, pearls. Um, and again, you can see that quite often the majority of the inside is white, but it has this um, coloration which comes from the outside to the very lip of the inside of the shell. And there's a, a group uh, of them showing the different colors you can get from the outside. And when we look, we have uh, with a microscope or a loop, you have this flame structure again. So it's very typical flame structure. Um, it's, uh, this was a very interesting poll which was, was submitted many years ago and it actually showed two parts. It showed a, a a non-nacreous red or reddish area on the end, and then um, the sort of the rest of the pearl, which had a different structure. Uh, this is another spondylus pearl, um, which was found in, uh, in Baja, California. Uh, so Mexico again, and it shows this very fine flame, but you can see that there's a distinct bluish uh, coloration reflection here which is, from our experience, pretty typical of spondylus pearls. So, okay, I'm, I'm sort of uh, running out of time, I think, here. Um, so, Kelly, I'll, I'll keep going, okay? Sounds good. We <laughs> okay. do have a few questions, so, um, you know, if you, it'll just depend on how many questions you want to take at the end, but if you got more, okay, then okay. keep going. Oh. All right, well, I don't know how, how long we will stay. Someone asked how long we'll be, but okay, it's going to be a bit longer than I thought. Anyway, we're on gastropods now. So these are the univalves. Um, there's a whole selection of gastropods. And the most famous one, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with, is the Strombeidae family, which produces the conch. Um, so uh, you can say, usually Americans will say conch, and most people will say conch, but as being from the UK, I have often said conch. And so you can use both. Um, but but conch is probably the usual one. And it used to be known as Strombus gigas, so formerly Strombus gigas, but uh, there was a name change and it's more often known as Lobatus uh, gigas now, or the queen conch. Um, this is just showing uh, one of the, the shells in our collection. And these two beautiful pink pearls are what we usually expect from, from this mollusk. And again, we have the flame structures. So when you look at the surface, you get this beautiful flame structure pattern and it can vary a bit. You know, you can have fine or you can have quite broad spiky ones. Um, they're, they're very typical and, and everyone likes to see these. And it, it's one of the things, not only the color, but this pattern, 
makes uh, very desirable. And you can get a range of colors. So you, you see you have the pinks, the, ye uh, the yellows to the oranges. And this uh, one here on the right hand side is just showing a, a very nice piece, which I'm not sure where I took the image from. It probably was a, a, an auction catalog many years ago, um, showing a nice pink conch pearl. Um, Volutidae family, um, this is one of, one of the members, it's the mellow. Um, this is actually a, a, a mellow, mellow shell showing here specifically, um, but it's also referred to sometimes as the baler shell um, or vo volute. And quite often the baler because it's, whoops, sorry, because of the shape, um, it could be used to, to actually take water out of a canoe and bail the, the boat out. So it's sort of got this nickname is one of the reasons, but it produces very beautiful, large, um, non-nacreous uh, pearls with flame structure again. And uh, you can see here that there's a whole uh, number of them in, in species in the family. So uh, Mello uh, amphora is one of the famous ones. Mello broderiferi is another but probably most people know mellow mellow, but we cannot actually say for sure whether the pearl is from a specific one of these mollusks. So we would call them mellow, and most labs will call them just mellow pearl. So this is a very nice large one, a ring. Uh, we were told by the owner around 180 carats in a pendant. And the one interesting fact about mellows is that uh, there's a superstition by most people who appreciate and know them that they should not be drilled because this can be, bring bad luck. Again, we have a nice flame structure and you can see here. And uh, this one here is just showing the beautiful structure, which is actually similar to like Christmas trees. So they're not always the same structures. They, they can vary a little bit. And quite often some people ask me, well, if you, if you cut one of these pearls in half, then uh, uh, do they have the same structure as the nacreous pearls? And, so, and in actual fact, Ken, he took uh, one pearl once and cut it in half. And you could see here that yes, this proves that definitely it still does have concentric structure. Uh, when we look under a electron scanning electron microscope, we can actually see in detail the sort of uh, lamella type structure, the, the sort of um, interlocking labes or, or lamella in this, which give this flame pattern. Um, and this is actually some shell, some broken shell, um, which I um, took some photos of many years ago. And it's just showing um, that there are three section or three um, different segments of this shell. So the top part, you have one series uh, of, of lamellae in one direction. In the center, it was, it's traveling at right angles in another direction. And in the bottom, it's showing again in another direction. And if you turn that 90 degrees again, then the top one becomes, uh, of course, sideways on. The middle one, which was flat, becomes sort of straight on. And again, the bottom one here shows uh, opposite. And on the bottom here, you have the flame structure showing again. Uh, cassisis is something which is sometimes confused with mellow, but uh, when we see in the lab, we, we can see the difference between these. Um, and again, we have the, mel the, the flame structure, which is showing um, very beautiful flame structure. Um, but there are differences between mellow and other types of orange pearl, um, which show the flame structure. So we can usually be fairly comfortable separating them. Um, Hal Haliotidae family or the abalone, I'm sure many of you recognize this. Uh, this is a nacreous. So, um, it produces very beautiful pearls, as you'll see in a minute. But we have two types. We have the red and we have the green blue. Um, so you can get different colored abalone. And this is the, the type of pearls which come um, from some of them. So very typical shape. We call them dog tooth um, or shark tooth. Um, and they are very desirable by some dealers who like to make unusual pieces of jewelry, very beautiful colors. When we look under the microscope, if we all of the loop, we can see here there is a structure, very typical structure of it. So not only can you tell they, they are abalone from just looking at the color usually, but when you look at the structure, you have this sort of boitroidal type uh, bumpy surface. But in actual fact, this is not on the surface. The, the higher we go in magnification, you will see. 
And when we actually do a high magnification, you can see that there has the nacreous structure on the surface. So this sort of boitreoidal type effect is actually subsurface. Um, and it's um, very typical of these abalone pearls. And when we increase really, you can see very clearly the, the, the nacreous platy structure on the surface here with that effect behind. Um, this is a horse conch, which was formerly known as Pleuropoca species, but now again, uh, these days it's Triplophusus. Um, um, there's actually a debate about this, even amongst the experts as to which name is correct to use. Um, but uh, most people I think are using Triplophusus now. Uh, this, that was a shell and the pearls which were actually submitted in Hong Kong um, maybe a couple of years ago now. And these are the two pearls in, in a little bit closer detail. So, you know, one of them is 126 carats, so that's pretty big. And it shows how big these, some of these non-nacreous pearls can get. Um, the smaller one, which is a, a better quality one, was nearly five carats. And again, when you look at the structures of these, you have beautiful flame structure. And uh, the, the horse conchs tend to show slightly different flames from the other species, so we can um, fairly comfortably separate them. Oops, sorry, I don't know what I did there, but uh, hang on, let me go back. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so um, just a few more shots of the horse conch structure, but the top ones show sort of fairly typical horse conch and the bottom ones are a little bit more challenging. They, this one here on the bottom left could actually be um, very mellow-like. So it's not always easy. So we have to use other tests. Um, I'm getting towards the end now. So this is actually Cypri, uh, Cypriae um, family, and it's, uh, you'll see from here pre pretty much uh, you'll all recognize it without the mantle uh, showing around it. This is the tiger cowrie, and it can produce pearl, but it's pretty rare. And the pearl isn't so exciting. Um, and this is just showing it has a much smaller aperture. The shell is different, so it doesn't usually produce very large pearls when it does. So to finish, some odds and ends. This one I showed you before is the tridacna shell. Um, but this is also a clam, um, but it's, it's the jewel box clam, but it comes from the Chamedi family. And it's interesting because you can see it has a, a, a blister pearl or um, blister feature in the center, which is a completely different color to the inside shell. So it's not always the case, but if you have the inside color of the shell, you will get always the, the pearl to be that color. There, there can be some reasons why the color can change. I'm not sure of them to be honest, um, but, but it, it does happen where you can get uh, different colored pearls from the inside color of the shell. And here's just showing the detail a bit more uh, closely. It's, it's a non-nacreous structure. But on one area of the shell, the purple areas, you also have a different structure. So you can see the flame structure as well. So you have two different structures in that shell. And this is the, again, a true oyster. It's the Oystriidae family, but it's not quite the same as the usual ones you see, for instance, in the oyster bars. Um, this one is, uh, is uh, Lofa cristalagali, which is also known as the coxcomb oyster. And it just has a very, definite appearance to it. It's sort of almost like it's uh, pretty dangerous and you wouldn't want to get your foot trapped in that. So uh, we are at the end almost now and we have Orient. The colors of the shells and the pearls which I've been discussing so far really are the body colors of them and they're due to most of the time for the colored pearls and shells, they're due to different uh, pigments or organic pigments. Whereas we do get on the surface of many pearls, um, what we call the orient, which is an iridescent effect. It's the actual diffraction and refraction of the light from the platelets, which are found on the nacreous pearls. And you can, you can see it's got this beautiful spectrum of colors. And this is a pink tarda margaritifera shell. And of course, this is a, um, a pearl from, from that shell, from that species rather. Um, and 
just a little bit different in the very end is we have this, which is also a shell, but it's a fossilized shell. Um, and it again shows wonderful coloration. So in actual fact, this is uh, an ammonite and it's more to do with uh, iridescence than orient. We can't really call it orient as such because orient we usually use for pearls and the organics. Um, whereas this is more of an iridescent effect. Uh, um, and it, the, the material which is cut from ammonites is called, when you sell it in the trade, am, uh, amolite or corite. Um, but it's, it's just something just to end off. So finally, just to acknowledge some people who helped me, of course, there are many people um, who were also providing the, some of the images and um, who I sort of got a lot of information over the years from. So that's them. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, sorry, I had to speed up a bit there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, so question answers. So Kelly, over to you. Yes. Well, thank you, Nick. This is such incredible information. I'm seeing many people in the chat ask for a part two or more about pearls. So I assure you there will be plenty more. Um, Nick is a wealth of knowledge, so we, we wouldn't run out of any content. So uh, just a few questions from the, from the audience. Will a shell change color because of time like pearl? Sorry, change color because of what? Over time. Oh, over time. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of them are probably pretty stable as far as the color is concerned. I mean, it, it depends on uh, how you treat the shell or even the pearl, because of course that will relate to the pearls too. So um, on the whole, from, from what I know and from my colleagues and people I've ever dealt with uh, before, they'll say that there isn't going to be any change unless uh, certain species possibly you put them in the wrong conditions or you don't treat them correctly. So for instance, some species, if you have them in excess light or heat or the wrong type of wavelengths of light, like uh, for instance, ultraviolet or x-rays, they can change um, as a result. But on the whole, they're, they're pretty stable. Okay. Um, are there any cultured pearl farms in the Persian Gulf or are they all natural pearls? No, there, there are at least a couple of farms that I know about. Um, so they're not all natural these days, no. Can you tell, I know you touched on this a little bit with the color, mm. um, but can you tell if a pearl is natural or cultured with the naked eye? Uh, if you have an awful lot of experience, like some people I know, um, there are many of the Indian dealers, there are many of the uh, um, Middle Eastern dealers, and there are quite a few gemologists who have handled pearls for a long time. They may be able to have a good idea, um, but it's more of a feeling, uh, unless it's you know, something really obvious, like a freshwater Chinese pearl, most people will be able to know those. But if you were saying salt water, natural versus cultured, um, especially when we're talking about non-beads versus natural, it gets a little bit harder. Um, so you would, to be safe, you'd need to send it to a lab. And um, I've, I've, I mean, just to give one example, I know we're running out of time. Um, I had one person who came to the Bangkok lab and submitted a pair of earrings and, and I had to meet with him later anyway. Um, but when he submitted them, uh, I looked at the pearls and they were in very nice uh, earrings and they were quite big and they looked like they were South Sea cultured pearls, honestly. They looked like they were bead cultured South Sea pearls. Um, but I think they were in like a Shome or Bulgari settings. So that was sort of maybe one clue, I don't know. But we were both convinced they were cultured. But when we finished testing them, they were natural. And we were both shocked that they were natural. So. <laughs> You know. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, so where do the colors from freshwater pearls come from? Um, well, freshwater and saltwater, they all come from the mollusks and the genes of the, of the host mollusk. So um, you, you have the genetics of the mantle from which produces the shell and the, then the pearls. Um, and you have the natural pigments within the genes. And of course, this comes in part from 
the water conditions and the food and all these different things which will have an influence uh, eventually on the color. Okay. So does the color of the shell impact the color of the pearl? Uh, like is yes. there? Yeah. Okay. The, the, shell, the shell color, as, as I mentioned, is a pretty much a reflection of what the pearl will be in the end. So if, for example, I just take the conch, the conch shell I showed you before, and you know it has that beautiful pink color. So what you tend to get are the beautiful pink pearls. So it's, it's directly related. And again, with, uh, with uh, um, the mellows, you have that orange shell. Virtually every mellow is orange. Not always every. I mean, I've, I've seen or heard about one or two white ones. Very, very rare. Um, but uh, they are usually orange. And the shell is orange, the pearls are orange. So yeah, they're linked. And when, when you have a pearl farmer, um, what they are doing, so, say the, the golden pearls, for example, they will be trying to find the best donor shell, which produces the best uh, golden color shell, and take the mantle from that to use in the host shell to try and make the, the pearls that color from the, the donor shell. So it's, it's linked. Okay. How rare are conch pearls and where do they come from? Um, they're, they're pretty rare. I mean, it's, it's difficult to say exactly quantify it in percentage terms or figure terms, but uh, as a whole, out of all the pearls that exist in the world, they are rarer than the nacreous pearls. Um, I've heard figures um, banded around of maybe 10,000 shells being opened and you'll find one pearl. Um, a, a lot of people have sort of quoted that before. Whether it's strictly true, I, I don't know, but that gives you an idea. Okay. Um, how is climate change affecting pearl farming? And is there any sense of how the industry is planning to adapt? Uh, over the years, some of the farmers have been obviously very worried about climate change um, impacting for instance, global warming. So if the temperature of the earth is going up and the sea temperature goes up, this will impact the mollusks as well. So it will basically affect the, the production. Um, and so definitely there is a concern there. And recently, because of COVID-19, I mean, this is probably the only benefit out of all of this at the moment is we know that the planet is having a bit of a rest from pollution, you know, whether it's planes, cars, whatever. Um, and there are signs that even, even in the seas, um, I saw somebody who, who is very well known for pearls and is in, the, in the North America, um, even actually up, I think, to Canada, who posted today that he's seeing an improvement in the water conditions when he's going out to, to see and find natural pearls. So, and he, he knows about these things. So he's, if he's seeing an improvement, it means you know, things really are getting a bit better and they were getting worse before. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for Baroque pearls, what mm -hmm. area of the world do you usually find this kind of pearl and what is the main family that this kind of pearl comes from? Baroque is just the name of a shape. So you know, it's not really, specific to a, a type of mollusk. Any mollusk can produce Baroque pearls. Um, so basically, you can't really answer that question and say it comes from one shell or one place. You can get Baroques in every mollusk uh, from any location, really. It's just, just a shape. So any mollusk, any location? Yeah, I, there, there are, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, I, I might, <laughs> Generally. When I think when I think about it later, I might say, "Oh, why did I say that?" But at the moment, <laughs> at the moment, yes, I think that's pretty much the case. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, you know, I think we're we have a we have a wealth of questions, so uh -huh. we'll do our best to follow up with people um, after this session. And if you have any questions, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us on social media. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Uh, we'll be able to get back to you there as well. And I just want to say thank you again so much for Nick, okay. to one, Nick for joining one, us. One second. It's just the last slide we have to show, no? And, yes, and we on. do. We have to promote Wim's talk. So um, yeah. 
uh, follow us on social, uh, reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, we'll make sure that if you have any Pearl related questions that they get to Nick and we can get you in, get them answered for you and uh, join us again next week. So uh, we'll be joined by Wim, who will talk about uh, connecting sources, treatment and science specifically for rubies. So thanks everyone. Thanks for sticking with us as we went a little long and don't worry, there will be plenty more Pearl sessions. Uh, so uh, tune in again. And thank you very much for everyone joining. Uh, I said, especially those who, I, I, I'm not sure if anyone in Japan is still awake, but um, <laughs> you know, maybe they fell asleep halfway through my talk. Uh, and Hong Kong, <laughs> th thank you, Cheryl, if you're still up, I don't know. She's one of the team in Hong Kong who said she would watch. <laughs> I, I didn't make her watch, she wanted to watch, so there we are. <laughs> and you'll all get a recording as well. So if it was too late for some of you, uh, you'll be able to watch. Okay, okay thank so. you everyone. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.